Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Jennings, as Sam mentioned, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to our session today. Um, sorry, I've got this thing on my screen here. Um, the tax workshop, a workshop, Rackham Grad School 101, uh, filing taxes for graduate students. I may say that's probably a bit ambitious of a title, but what I do want to give you comfort is that we're going to be talking a lot about the taxation of scholarships and fellowships and how best to report them. And that's going to talk a lot about tax forms and so on. The issues, and I think these are the issues that you're going to be most concerned about, um, I guess from an overview perspective, you should know you're going to be looking at this as you're going to be bearing a significant tax burden that you may not have had in the past. And it may be a burden that's much higher or uh, much higher, I guess, anyway, that you, most taxpayers see. Certainly, you're going to have to be responsible for more in doing your taxes than I do. Uh, and I'm, I've been working at the university now for 25 years. Um, as we go through this, if you have, a, we mentioned, if you have any questions, this is the time to ask them. And I say not just questions about, you know, the, the, the concepts and so what your own personal situation. I do get emails from time to time from people saying, hey, I have a situation. I'd like to talk to you about it. Well, unfortunately, as the tax director for the university, I'm not allowed to answer any questions for individuals, including uh, President Ono, um, for insurance or risk reasons. But this is a time you can ask. So we're going to get into some very interesting topics, including coolly estimated tax payments and um, multi-state filing requirements, which you may have uh, your, in your own personal situation. So do feel free to ask. Um, okay, now I got to go to the next page. There we are. So uh, generally, uh, 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 this is basically the agenda as we go through this. Um, the real question is, is there a lot of people are shocked. There's taxable income with scholarships and fellowships, and we want to get you up to speed with what those rules are so you feel more comfortable with that. Um, then once you have a tax liability, how do you pay the tax? How does this happen? How do I actually, you know, get this payment to the IRS? When am I supposed to do it? How much am I supposed to do and so forth? Um, in which case we'll talk some about tax returns. So we take scholarships and fellowships and we put it onto the returns and you get a feel for how that works. Um, and there's certain concepts we're going to talk about there, which is filing threshold, the standard deduction, and of course, different types of income tax returns. So, so then how do I pay federal and state quarterly estimated taxes. And that's something you're going to have to do as well and part of a burden. And we're going to talk about that. But this is something that you're going to not only have to identify, you're going to have to pay the taxes in and you're going to have to do it uh, throughout the year rather than, than at the, the April of next year, which is what many folks have done up till now. And then, of course, we talked about this earlier, but there's multi-state filing obligations. First, you might have to file with a state. You will have to file in Michigan. We have a tax regime, but you may, because you were in other states earlier in the year or somewhere else, have multi uh, responsibilities for multiple states. So we'll talk some about that as well. Um, to give you the to really start this out, we really need to just talk about the basic rules. Now, this is for federal taxes. That's the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, most states follow the Internal Revenue Code if they have a tax regime. You'll hear about this as we go through. Florida doesn't. Uh, Texas doesn't, Tennessee, and so forth, but not too many. Um, but here are the general rules, and the states tend to follow this as well. Uh, when it comes to the Internal Revenue Code, everything is defined broadly, pretty much against the favor of the taxpayer. So the taxpayer is just about everybody, individuals, trusts, estates, corporations, the University of Michigan as well, and we're a government entity. Uh, it taxes you on basically everything. It's called an accretion of wealth. And you can see wages, interest, rental income, cap gains, um, it, it would tax happiness if it could quantify it. So I just want to let you know, it's very broad in its sense. Um, now, something we talk about is income tax, and there are other tax regimes. One is Social Security tax, and uh, we collect it from you from what you've earned, uh, earned income. And then you'll get paid that when you get old enough, you get that money back in theory. Um, and the way it really works is, of course, the, um, uh, the working generation supports the retired generation. So uh, you guys, uh, you students, will be covering for me when I get older, just as I'm covering for folks who are currently retired. Um, uh, so that's, it's, it's sort of a, it may not be dollar for dollar, but that's the theory of how it works. Anyway, th that really won't apply here. Uh, I haven't seen it much with many of the scholarships and fellowships we've dealt with. So we're really talking about income tax, and that's something to keep in mind as we go. That said, you do have a federal and a state. Um, pretty much they're going to tax you on the same income. Um, raising the question of why did we have a Boston Tea Party? Um, but it is what it is. Something with federal taxes, and this isn't always with states, you have graduated tax bracket. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea is the more you make, the more you pay in on the same dollar. 
Um, and they do this based on certain classifications, single, married. You can, you can be married filing jointly, married filing separately. So the idea is I just want to accommodate you in many different ways. And there is a preference depending upon what classification you like. Um, for most individuals, we file a tax return based on the calendar year end. It's 12 months. It goes from January to December. Some people will say, well, I got some money. I really, I only worked for 13 months. Well, that doesn't go into one tax year. That goes into two tax years, one month for the uh, tax return, and then the other 12 months in the other tax return. Um, you also are done on a cash basis. That's how you're really accounting for your income. So if someone uh, has said where, you know, you, you something is available to you, but they haven't really paid it to you or made it constructively available to you, then you may argue that it's not yet taxable to you. Not necessarily something that happens here, but it is something to keep in mind, particularly when you're getting into estimated taxes. When did you really get the money? Um, because there's certain periods that define what quarter you have to make the payments. Um, interesting concept here, and this is for some countries, but not all countries. The United States will tax you on your worldwide income. So you go over to Ireland, which basically has a much lower tax rate, uh, and you sell your art and paintings and so forth, and you're going to have to pay taxes in Ireland because you're in Ireland. Then you come back to the U.S. and you, they're going to say, do your tax return. And you go, well, I'm not going to put on the money that I made, the gains I made when I sold the art. And they're going to say, you have to. And you're like, well, no, no, you don't understand. I, I already paid just to Ireland. And they go, yeah, and you're going to pay to us too. Um, and this is a very important concept because you're going to see it in the multi-state issues as well. And, and the reason is you're, you're, you're a citizen of the U.S. and they tax you on your worldwide income. We don't care where you are. And to the extent you pay taxes in Ireland, we'll give you a credit for those taxes. But if our rate is higher, then you're going to pay the difference in the rate to the, to, to the IRS or to Treasury. So just something to keep in mind. Um, but you'll hear this as we go. And you won't necessarily see it from a foreign perspective, but much more from a multi-state perspective. And then there's a concept of you pay your taxes as you earn them. So if we give you money in February, you're going to be paying taxes on that in the first quarter of that calendar year. Um, and that's very interesting because, you know, I was a kid, I always thought when you paid taxes, it was April 15th of the following year. And that's why they called it tax day. But actually, you're paying taxes all throughout. And that April 15th date, that's a reconciliation date. You file a return to say, here's what I owe. Here's what I actually paid in. And the difference, I either get back in a refund or I pay. And uh, that's how it generally works. So these are the general concepts you're going to get. And we're pretty much going to talk about them as we go through this. Now, as we go through, I think one of the most important things to know about is this income tax bracket. Again, not all states do this, so it's something to keep in mind. Michigan has a flat rate. It's a 4.05%. used to be 4.25. They just changed it and uh, for the 23-year. And it, it's for all income. But in this case, with the graduated rate at the federal level, uh, for the first $11,000 uh, for a student, you're only taxed at 12, uh, 10%. Uh, for any amount between the 11 and up to 44,725, you're at 12%. So you can see, same, it's just $1 more, uh, you, you go over 1101, $11,001, and that extra dollar is now at 12 cents instead of 10. Uh, and that's what they always mean when they say, you kick me into a higher tax bracket. Um, but that's basically the lay of the land. Um, now there's, uh, income, there's income tax tables to use, and there's actual calculations for brackets. It's your choice as to how you want to do it. Most people take the, uh, the uh, tables. So let's talk about taxation of scholarships and fellowships. Again, despite the very ambitious title that we have, I wanted to make sure that something that we really just talked about are nuts and bolts, and that would be the taxation of scholarships and fellowships. Uh, now, you have to understand, in the Internal Revenue Code, everything's taxable, uh, any kind of accretion of wealth that we talked about, unless there's an exception. And there is an exception, Code Section 117, uh, that talks about qualified scholarships. When they define qualified scholarships, that means that there's unqualified or non-qualified scholarships, and then they would be taxed. So it's got it's very important to understand what's a qualified scholarship. And in this case, you basically meet the criteria, which is you're uh, pursuing a candidate for a degree with the purpose of studying, conducting it at the University of Michigan, which is an educational institution. Um, and what actually is a payment, a qualified scholarship payment, is anything for uh, that re relates to tuition and fees and fees for enrollment or attendance. A lot of times you have tuition and then they say, by the way, in addition, you have some fees. They would both be lumped together and they would be considered qualified scholarship. There's also uh, incidental expenses 
that you come across when you actually have to go out and buy books or supplies or equipment that's required for the instruction. And, and I always use an example back in my day, uh, they gave you a syllabus and on you know, the left-hand column were books that were required. And then in the right-hand column were books that uh, were recommended. Well, basically the qualified scholarship only applies to the books on the left-hand side. Um, so that's that would then be considered to be qualified scholarship. Non-qualified scholarship is everything else. And that's really, a lot of times that's stipend. We use that word stipend. There's no definition of the Internal Revenue Code for that. And that's basically used to pay rent or buy food or anything along those lines. That's gonna be um, uh, taxable, taxable income because it's not for your tuition. It's not for fees. It's not required as part of your uh, course instruction. Anyway, that's taxable income uh, uh, on the general basis. And we'll talk some more about it as we go through, but I want to give you comfort there. And again, it doesn't include self-employment tax. Self-employment tax is when you're working for someone or FICA, which is it'd be an employer. Um, self-employment tax would be for an independent contractor. And that would come up where they, the, the grantor was saying, you have to do this. We want this kind of work. We want this project. We want it by the end of the month. Uh, you have to put so many hours into it. Uh, you need to be working from nine to five. That, there's none of this restrictions with, re, with respect to the scholarship or fellowship you get. So it's not likely, uh, and nor have I seen it where it's uh, subject to uh, self-employment tax or FICA. Uh, that said, every once in a while, the IRS will send out notices on this case uh, and say, you do owe it. Um, and they do this for a bunch of students. You know, they just grab a bunch of them and they say, you owe it. Well, I do want to let you know that is something that the University of Michigan would respond to because um, it's a design flaw. The IRS is incorrect and they're taxing our students. Um, uh, Hi, it's Ed. not. Someone asked about monetary prizes and like awards that come from a writing contest. Are those taxable? Yes. Or yes, a moving stipend from their program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any, they, basically, that's a great point. So you have to find a code section to get it out. Um, there is a code section on prizes, gifts, and awards, uh, uh, 72, 79. And um, it, it is a, uh, um, a, you know, your Olympic medal was taxable up until recently, just to let you know. So chances are, unless it's de minimis, uh, it's going to be taxable. Um, and yeah, moving has been considered to be taxable. So used prior to the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, there were exceptions and so forth. And you might, if it was truly moving, uh, you might be able to get out of that. But at this point in time, uh, it's taxable. It's been, um, it uh, has been um, in place up until 2026. So if Congress continues it, it will continue. I think they will, but they may, they may end it and bring back the uh, tax-free treatment to some of the expenses. But right now, moving expenses are taxable. Thank you. Anything else, Sam? Not for now, thanks. I would like to say, everyone, please change your name to the name that you registered with so that we know that you're here. Thanks, Ed. Yep, okay. So that's income, and that's very interesting. Some uh, One question we tend to get from time to time too, Sam, if I can just throw it out, is loans. Uh, I got a loan. Well, a loan is not taxable income. And the reason is you have to pay it back. So it's not an accretion of wealth over a period of time. It is for that short period, you got it. But over a period of time, you got to pay it back. It's not increasing wealth. But that said, if it gets forgiven, then in the year that it's forgiven, it is taxable income because now you have an increasing wealth. You don't have to pay it back. So that's really the the, 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 the the opposite side of the coin when it comes to taxable income, just to give you a sense. Um, so now we've got, so, so how, do, how do we, okay, so now I got this non-qualified scholarship. Uh, I, I identified it. Um, I determined what, what basically, it considers because uh, I've, I've looked at what's curriculum and required and so forth. So now I've got tax liability. I owe the IRS something. How do I get it there? And this is really part of the discussion we're going to have. I do know there are certain forms out there that actually the IRS has and they work with. And uh, all employers issue W-2s uh, for their employees. And on the W-2, it will identify the tax liability the taxable income the person earned, it'll compute the taxes. It'll also withhold the taxes. So basically, that's where I am in my situation. I just file a return April 15th because my taxes have been identified. The taxes have been paid and they've been paid by the university, not me. Um, if you're a non-resident alien, and again, this is a term by the code, that would be a foreign-born individual who hasn't been in the U.S. long enough to be a resident alien. 
certain advantages to that. If you're a resident alien, you're taxed like a U.S. citizen on your worldwide income. If you're a non-resident alien, often referred to as an NRA, um, you don't. You can only. You're only going to be subject to your U, to tax on your U.S. sourced income. Uh, that's by the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, your country, your home country, may tax you on worldwide income, much like the scenario we discussed with Ireland. But just the same, that is that's you need to know what your classification is if you're foreign born, whether you're NRA or not. Uh, when we get through this, uh, we do have some slides on NRAs just to give you comfortable. Um, if you get a 1042S, you are getting a form from the University of Michigan. You can call up payroll. Uh, they issue the 1042S and ask them questions about it. They also issue W-2. So if you happen to be a GSRA during the year at some time and you get a W-2, you can call them about your W-2. You can't call me about your scholarships or um, fellowships because basically none of the forms here apply to us or apply to your situation. Um, that would be uh, as a domestic uh, U.S. citizen or as a resident alien. Um, and that's because the third bucket, the 1099, that's what you should be getting. If you're a U.S. Non, a non resident aliens, foreign born, who haven't been here long enough, get a 1042S, then that would mean everyone else should be getting a 10, 1099. That would be U.S. citizens and, and the resident aliens. Un years ago, when this rule came out, 1986, I believe, um, uh, the uh, uh, Treasury decided to issue a regulation that said uh, employers uh, and uh, schools don't have to issue uh, a 1099 for uh, its students who are receiving uh, uh, scholarships and fellowships. The ta the, the, and that would be the non-qualified piece. So you, you, you're not getting a form. And that's the burden we talked about earlier. You, you students are expected to identify your tax liability, quantify it, and then pay it in. And that's basically what we're going to go through for the next uh, rest of the time we have together. So, um, and that's the difference. So now if you're a non-resident, again, uh, uh, you're a graduate student, you get a scholarship or fellowship, the non-qualified scholarship or fellowship will be reported on the 1042S for you. So they identify it, the University of Michigan, and they qualify, quantify it for you and they pay a tax. And again, you really have that, that April 15th deadline that you have to worry about, but no other. But if you're a, a, a U.S. citizen or a resident alien, you basically have to worry about identifying your tax, quantifying your tax, and paying it in quarterly. Again, you got to pay it as you go. That's the earn it as you go theory. So that's where the hub of this presentation really focuses on. So as you go through this, again, if you have questions, feel free to ask. And there are uh, a few questions. Sure. Uh, does the stipend from the university um, count as a qualified scholarship? Uh, typically, the way the university works it from a process perspective, I'd have to say no. I think it's a non-qualified scholarship. It's taxable. If that answers the question right, um, it is a it's taxable. And the reason is your tuition, which counts, is basically waived. You don't get money for the tuition. Then you pay back you of them. You just don't get charged for tuition. So if you're getting money, it should be used for basically rent and so forth. The only time you get to call it a qualified uh, scholarship would be whether you spent it for any kind of expenses that are required as part of the curriculum, like certain books. Um, so that's where it comes down. So basically, you know, the cash at the end of the year that you're getting in a stipend is probably going to be taxable income. And you just need to figure out whether any of those exceptions apply. But a good chunk of it, if not all of it, is going to be taxable income, if I answered that question. Thanks, Ed. Um, does somebody, do we have to keep our address um, at the permanent one that's on our driver's license or our local Ann Arbor address? Well, that's a great question. A lot of these, that, that's a good question. And uh, something to keep in mind that we have at the very last page are IRS publications, and they're extremely helpful. In this case, publication 17 will probably address that. Um, my sense is uh, what's on your driver's license may be from California or some other state. Um, so you really want to let the IRS know where you are currently. That said, you do try to keep all your addresses current. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, but at the very end, you'll see, uh, so a lot of the topics we're talking about will be, um, uh, there's materials, supporting materials really from the IRS as well. So they can help you get through this. So, uh, we often get questions of what kind of resources can I use? And that happens. There's also one on estimated taxes, um, non-resident aliens, and we have one on students, student tuition. So it pretty much covers the, the gamut. Do know when any publication uh, that you get, 
uh, it's been drafted by the IRS for the IRS. They're not too worried about your arguments or your opportunity to take uh, uh, take exception uh, to any of the taxable income items, in which case we recommend that you go to Master Tax Guide and other things like that, which can help you understand a little bit more what's going on and give you various positions that the IRS doesn't. Again, the IRS is just another party to a court case, so they're not the judge, and they feel here are the rules, but they're not going to tell you the side that uh, benefits you. So it's very one-sided, but it is pretty clear, at least as far as that's concerned. So there is something, but there's also um, Master Tax Guide, and you can always use TurboTax to, to get through what you need. Um, Sam, any other questions? Yes. Um, paying taxes to Michigan, is it quarterly or is it annually? Yeah, we'll get to that as we go. Uh, okay. And it's what, quarterly and painfully. Quarterly and painfully. Okay. Um, if a student is a non-resident alien um, and they had a fellowship stipend from January to April and then started working from May to December, what forms would that student need to collect? They'll probably get both a 1042S for the short period, uh, January to April, uh, because some of that uh, payment will be non-qualified. To the extent it's non-qualified, it'll go on a 1042S. Um, and then once they start working here, whether you're for, whether you're a non-resident alien or not, you are an employee, you'll probably get a W-2 and uh, as a graduate student or so. And then from May on, you'll get a W-2 from the University of Michigan. The good news is they're withholding for you and uh, identifying your tax and withholding. And with the 1042S, they're doing the same. So in that scenario, Sam, that individual probably just has to worry about the April 15th deadline the next year. Mm, okay. Unless they, unless they made money elsewhere, but that's the idea, you know. So for stipends, are 1099s um, issued and are, they, are people able to make deductions like as they were independent contractors? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so there's two concepts here. One, um, the, the exception for scholarships and fellowships is why you will not get a 1099. And I do not believe you'll qualify for uh, a, a independent contractor because you're not working for us. It's not earned income. Um, you are, uh, and you'll see how that benefits you to some degree. And in this case, it hurts you because you're not in your own business. If you were in business, you'd be subject to self-employment taxes too. So at least you're not subject to, and that's 15.3%. So at least you're not paying that. You're just paying the income tax, but you won't qualify as an independent contractor if you're receiving scholarships from the University of Michigan. Okay, thank you. I all right. So the rest in the chat. All righty. Uh, so with the NRAs, I'll pick up. So what's interesting is, uh, you know, you get defined really by your presence here in the U.S. And uh, if you're here for a long period of time, you can apply for a green card. There is a substantial presence test that the Internal Revenue Code puts out. And it's basically, if you're here half the year, you're more here than elsewhere. So we're going to make you file as if you're a resident alien uh, and pay tax on your worldwide income. Uh, and you can also do it through marriage. If you're a non-resident alien, you're only taxed on your U.S. sourced income. So, you know, if you're a, a, a non-resident alien and you have tremendous amounts of gains from stock that you sold, that, that won't be subject to tax because you didn't get that from, earn that while you're in the U.S. But the scholarship, you did because you were here and you had the scholarship in, in Michigan at the University of Michigan. So you'll be taxed on your scholarship, but you won't be taxed on your cap gain from your stock. Um, again, payroll will issue the form, a 1042S, and they do a withhold of 14%, which pretty much covers the tax bill for the most part, but it all depends on uh, how the tax return is filed. Um, but again, if you have questions on a form, you can call U of M's resources. The, the department that issued the form is more than willing to answer any of your questions. And that goes back to the 1099 question, Sam, to the US citizens and the resident aliens, we're not issuing a form of any kind with a scholarship or fellowship. They're not getting a W-2 because they're not working for us. They're, they're not getting a 1099 because it's not earned income. So. I don't have a form, so I can't answer your questions. That's the idea. Other than that, I'm giving advice. And again, that's what's one of the principles we have is, uh, is how we, have, that's why we're here presenting now. because We want the students to know as much as we can explain to them. And this is the only format we can do it in, an educational format. Um, what's interesting with NRAs is as much as there's a presence test by the Internal Revenue Code, treaties override the Internal Revenue Code. So there may be in your treaty, your home country has a treaty with the U.S., they may be a provision in there for students that says you're a non-resident alien for five years or something like that, in which case you won't 
you don't have to worry about being subject to tax removal white income. Uh, and you'll continue to get a 1042S. There's also an issue on FICA, which again, I bring this in, it's noise. People will ask the question, again, as a scholarship or fellowship recipient, you're most likely not going to be subject to FICA. Um, the tax returns, you know, we talk about individual returns. You're getting a W-2. We talked about those. Well, they all go into 1040. That's the form for individuals. Corporations do 1120. Individuals do 1040. Where they came from with that, I don't know. But there's two types. There's the 1040 for the U.S. citizen and the resident alien, which is a, just a plain 1040. And then there's a 1040 NR for non-residents. Uh, and they take the 1040 to West and put that on there. So multiple forms. And we will follow a lot of forms upon forms, cups within cups, as we go through some of this. Um, again, you can contact payroll via question. We also have a pretty active, very robust international center. They even have a software, a tax software for non-resident aliens to help them prepare their tax returns for free. So my sense is do feel free, do, please do take advantage of the resources that they offer you here. So you will enjoy that. Um, and that's probably the last we're going to spend a lot of time on non-resident aliens. Um, and that's because most of this is geared to U.S. citizens and resident aliens. Again, because you carry this tremendous burden. You now have to figure out whether you have tax. You have to figure out if you have tax, how much, and then how you got to pay it. And more importantly, when. So here is what we have is a quick quiz. Um, and it's $50 deduction or a $15 credit. And it's a trick question. I'll just give you that up front. So what you have in the left-hand column is really the formula to, to quantify your taxable income. How much income do you have? What deductions do you have? There's your taxable income. What's your tax? Do you have any credits to offset the tax? See, credits go against the tax. The deduction goes against the income. And you'll see how that plays out. So in the middle column, you take the $50 deduction. Well, 100 less 50 leaves you, leaves you with $50 of taxable income. At the tax rate of 10%, it's $5, it's better than 10. Um, and then you have no credit, so you owe $5. But a credit, it's only $15, but look how powerful it is. Now, you don't get a deduction, so you pay, you have $100 worth of taxable income. At 10%, that's $10. But a $15 credit wipes out that $10 because the credit goes against the tax. Um, and in this case, if it's non-refundable, you don't owe anything. But if it's refundable, you should get very excited about this, um, you get the five bucks back. You get money back. Always a good thing when the IRS... But the government is going to give you money back. So that is the theme of, oh, I'm sorry, how these returns work. Um, now we've got um, the form 1098T. Um, I mentioned this because this deals with a credit. Now, the problem is it won't apply to scholarships and fellowships, and I'll explain to you why. So again, this is noise. But to some extent, you're going to hear this and you're going, what's going on? How can, I said credit. I should get excited about credit. Um, this is really for your education if you pay for your education. And there's two credits. One's really for uh, undergrad and one's for grad. Uh, the American Opportunity Credit is refundable, whereas the Lifetime Learning Credit is not. You're more likely to qualify for Lifetime Learning Credit. Um, this There's a lot of information on this. The Student Financial Services provides a form. You may get the form. You're most likely to. Feel free to reach out and ask them questions. They gave you a form. You can learn from them, so it's not a problem. Now, I say you're not entitled to it because this is a, uh, again, this is from an IRS publication. Now, some of this is uh, not current. The IRS hasn't come out with the new, the new publication for 2023. They usually won't until probably the beginning of 24. So you're stuck with 22. But 22 and 23 will read the same, I promise you, the rule hasn't changed. And you see, you've got to go from, uh, through this flow chart. And the second box from the bottom were the same expenses paid entirely with a tax-free scholarship grant or employer-provided educational assistance and tax-free scholarship. So to the extent that you have qualified scholarships, you're not going to be able to take this credit. That's what it pertains to. The credit says, how much did you pay for your tuition? And non and, and then the tax-free scholarships are qualified that pertain to your tuition. And if it's tax-free, you don't get to take it on your tax return. That would be a double dip. You're not paying tax on it, but at the same time, you get a, you get a credit for it. So you're not going to be able to do that. Um, and this applies. I know this talks about the American Opportunity Credit, but this is a lifetime learning. And it has the same box. So basically, if you get a 1098T and you think it's a credit and you think it's going to work for you, do, do realize this may not apply to you. So what you'll get is a 1098-T. That's what the form looks like from our um, financial services. Um, and uh, in box one is the amount of tuition that you've basically paid. 
Box five is the scholarship given to you. Box five at times can be equal to or greater than box one. Well, five is a contra account. It reduces what's in box one. And that's what you'll find. If you got a scholarship for 20 grand, it includes room and board, let's say, uh, including tuition and tuition's 10 grand, then it'll be 10 in box one, 20 in box five. And since box five is greater than one, you're not entitled to anything. That's what I'm trying to say. But I just wanted to make sure you're aware of this. And again, this does have a flip result. Some people do pay for their uh, education, particularly in the beginning part of the year. They come here and they get a scholarship. And, but they'll get a 1098T for that, that first part of the year. And if they pay for it, there won't be anything in box five. And they'll be able to actually uh, take the credit. So it can happen when you get it. But that's how it works. And that's the interrelationship with scholarships and fellowships, particularly qualified scholarships and fellowships, with respect to uh, the 1098T. Just to go a little bit further, if you do have it, you get to put it on an 8863. The IRS does not want to see this form. What they want to know is, can you as an individual pass this credit? Because there are further limitations on certain individuals. So if you're extremely wealthy, you won't get it anyway because it phases out over uh, uh, income tax brackets. So my sense is uh, it's it doesn't mean you're even entitled to the full amount here because you have to determine what you look like as an individual taxpayer to see what those limitations are. Um, so this brings us up to, uh, uh, by the way, I hope you don't mind my humor. Um, it's all we have to go on. Um, other than that, it's, it's particularly dry. And I remember once my kids were young, um, and by the way, uh, a pa as a parenting tool, I used to make them read these uh, presentations and they were only bad once because they never wanted to read it again. Um, and uh, one time my son asked, you always had these cartoons. Um, um, and it's funny, the, the further I go along, the less funny they are. And, and, and that's actually probably very true. So I try to keep the funniest ones for the end, but just to say uh, tax is wearing on you, even with your sense of humor, I want you to know. Um, so in this case, you're filing a return. So now we got up to return. We've gone from, I have income. I know there's no form for me. Again, this is for the resident, uh, resident alien and US citizens. And now I've got to do it on a form, which is I understand how's this work. So let's talk some about the form so you understand that. There's a filing threshold. Um, and that just means, and you can see for single here, if you're $13,850 worth of income. So you get a deduction for that right off. It's a, it's a straight dollar for dollar deduction. So if you have $12,000 stipend, nothing else for the entire year, you don't even have to file a tax return because you get to deduct. 13850 from the 12,000 and you're ahead of the game because the 13 is greater than the 12. So you don't have to worry about a tax bill anymore. You may want to file it though, in case at anywhere along the lines, you had some income tax withheld or something like that. You would get it back. It would free it up. But just the same, that is what the threshold is. It's an automatic deduction for you just breathing. That's all there is. Uh, you didn't have to do anything for it. You get it just for, just, just for existing. Um, now, there is an exception, which I call noise because it talks about dependency. And this was really important prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, because back then there were two deductions uh, that made up this 13850 One was a standard exemption and one was a dependency exemption. And that depended upon whether your um, guardians or your parents could claim you as a dependent. And if so, they could take it on the return. So they took that the second of the two deductions on their return, leaving you with just the one. It was a big deal back then. It isn't any longer. Uh, but I wanted to make you aware of that. I, I say that too, because many, many parents still have questions on this. So, And then there's these tests and the tests are whether you're a qualifying child or relative. And that's how you're going to be a dependent. It still applies to some extent because your guardians or parents may be able to take a credit on their return because you are a qualifying relative or child. Chances are you're not going to be. There's an age test under qualifying child. Um, you have to be under the age 24. And there is an income tax, uh, uh, income test under the qualifying relative, which means your income, and that would include the non-qualified scholarships, has to be less than 4,400. And, and that just doesn't tend to happen. So my sense is that's not necessarily going to be there. But these are things you're going to hear about. Again, it's not going to affect the calculation. And we have a case study. We'll go through it. But I want to let you know they're out there. Go ahead, Sam. So, Ed, someone asks if they are being claimed as a dependent, does that affect how they file taxes? And mm -hmm. if so, how? No, in fact, I, I don't think generally it should. 
Now, everybody has a different tax situation, so I can only answer your question generally, but here's the case study, and I think it'll prove it out. If you're a graduate student, you're single, um, and uh, so we use the 13850 standard. Um, the amount of uh, stipend you got was 14250. Uh, you're a U.S. citizen, which means you're, it's not on 1042S, or nobody's doing any withholding for you. Um, and you have no other income. You work solely on a scholarship. Now, at 23, theoretically, you could be a dependent or not, depending upon whether you made that test. Well, the, the, the return would look like this. So this is what a 1040 looks like. A lot of, lot of stuff going on. Got the name J Jane up here. Um, this is where you put all that information, your social security number. Uh, a lot of this you're going to pass because these are dependents and so forth. You don't have any dependents. You're single. Um, the scholarship you put on line one, by the way, if that helps. And uh, in this case, we talked about it from the case study, 14250 The deduction we know is 13850 Now, I apologize. This is still on a 2022 form. But again, it would be, the calculation would be the same. In fact, the 13850 is the 23 standard deduction. So think of this as a 23 return. So you get to deduct 13850 from the 14250 and you have $400 worth of taxable income. That's all. You have $14,000 and you only have 400 of taxable income. And then you have to figure the tax, which is 10%. We know from the bracket. So it's 40 bucks. I owe 40 bucks. And the best news is, and we'll talk about this when we get to quarterly estimated tax payments, but because it's under $1,000, you don't even have to do quarterly estimated tax payments. Um, so all you have to be concerned about is filing this form April 15th of the following calendar year. So good news. Um, and this happens, you're entitled to this 13850, whether you're a dependent or not. And the reason is, and it's in Pub 17, the only time they consider this 14250 to be earned income is when they look at the threshold that you get to use, which is 13850. So not to confuse you, but bottom line is, is and if and if I am confusing, I apologize, but bottom line is, is if you are dependent or not, you should still be able to complete your return the same. It should look the very same. Um, so that's why it's noise. Much ado about nothing in most cases. So that's the idea. Great question. Um, now we go to another case study. And this comes down to the, 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 the identifying the taxable income. In the one scenario, I'm a postdoc, I get a stipend of 15,000. Okay, it's clear, and I'm a US citizen, which means I don't, no one's withholding for me. And I'm using it for rent and other living expenses, meaning it's non-qualified scholarship. In the second scenario, it's a little more confusing. I get a grant award of 25, I then have to use 9,000 to pay for tuition. That's not what we do here, just to let you know, it doesn't work that way, but at some schools it does. And then I also have $1,000, which I took out of the 25,000 to pay for books and so forth that were required as part of the curriculum. So that left me with $15,000, much like above, for rent and other living expenses. So is the 15,000 taxable income or is it less or higher? Uh, do I show, at least in the second alternative, 25 on the return and subtract out the nine and the one to show them 15. Do I show them the math or do I just do the 15 if that's the taxable number? So again, you've seen this tax return. It looks very similar to the last one. We start with 15,000 and they like it on line one. Uh, it's not a wage, but it used to be put in other income, um, which is, um, I, I don't even, yeah, other earned income, uh, H. Um, and they had a lot of questions with that. So they like us to put it in line one, and they've been that way for the last 10 years or so. You subtract out the 13,850 because uh, you're single, and you get 11,150. And then, of course, you take 10% of that and you owe 150. Uh, and you'll notice, again, we'll go through it again. This is for both scenarios. Your $15,000 is taxable income because it's stipend that's not for tuition and it's not for um, um, the books that are required as part of the curriculum. In the alternative scenario, you had 25 and you already subtracted out what would be qualified, leaving you with the non-qualified of 15. Said differently, all the IRS wants is what's non-qualified. I just want your taxable amount. How you did the math, maybe you made a mistake, right? Maybe you put 2,000 down because you, you didn't keep the receipts and it's really 1,000 and the IRS comes out to look at it. You don't have it, you can't prove it, oh, you're all worried. Um, yeah. Guess what? That's exactly what the IRS says. We're going to put that burden on you. When we come to audit you, you better be right. But other than that, you don't have to show it to me. I don't, I'm not really going to be uh, looking for it. I'm just looking for that bottom line number, which in this case is $115. And again, since it's under a thousand, 
I don't have to file any quarterly estimated tax payments. So I'm only looking to do taxes April 15th of the following year. And if I'm getting money back, I want to do it in January because I get it earlier. But just the same, that's the scenario. Now Good. we're up to quarterly. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Speaking of quarterly, is the 13850 a standard deduction for the whole tax year or for each quarter? Is the I'm sorry, can you ask that again? It says, is the 13850 a standard deduction for the whole tax year or ah, for yes. the tax quarters? No, it would be nice if it was quarters. Um, when we go to do your quarterly estimated taxes, what we do is we tend to do it annually. And then that's where the 13 comes in. And then you come up with a, a liability number and then divide by four in theory. That's what you do. Um, uh, but in this case, uh, you're going to find that the 13, uh, the, the standard deduction is for the year, not for the quarter. So, um, and the IRS would not take kindly to the fact if you took, uh, if you took it on that quarterly. Sorry, I, I, I don't think it's funny, but they, uh, they get particular about certain things. Any other questions, Sam? Not at the moment. Okay, good. All right, folks. Well, you seem to be doing rather well with this. So certainly if you have any questions and as you go along, it's fine. The more time we have at the end, we can handle your uh, situation. So that's fine too. So now we've talked about, okay, I've got a tax liability. I understand what it means. I know how it goes on a return. Okay, I get it's my responsibility and I got to make these, what are they again? Quarterly payments? What's this about? So and that's the idea. You're going to have to every once in a while four times throughout the year, sit down and figure out what your taxes are in addition to that April 15th of the following year. Now, if you like, and this is just how it works, you can figure it out at the very beginning of the first quarter and pay it right then and there, all of it, not have to worry about paying it for the next three quarters. You may forget, you don't have to worry. You may say, I figured it out the first, nothing's changed. So you only have to figure it out once and then pay it over the next four quarters, the first one, when you figured it out in the next three. However you want to handle it, it's up to you. You can pay in early. You cannot pay late. And then we'll talk about that. Um, um, and, of course, this is supposed to be funny, um, but no one finds this funny. Uh, and it, the whole thing is very confusing. And I think part of it is it's not even structured well. Uh, they talk about four quarters. And you would think each month, every each quarter is three months. It's not. Um, the first quarter is. The second quarter is two. The third quarter is. The fourth quarter is. Um, five. So uh, it just doesn't work right. So that's just how it works. Um, and uh, the dates are different. Um, so you can see that with even at the year end, January 16th, if you file your entire tax return by the 31st, then you don't have to make a, a payment for the fourth quarter. Uh, and this IRS feels that that's a very big exception. To me, what happens to most folks are they're sitting here now going, oh my goodness, I didn't know anything about this. I haven't done a quarterly estimated payment for this year. And that is something that you're going to need to do. Um, and uh, it's due if you started uh, anytime from uh, uh, July on, you're going to have to, because um, it's a June payment in August. So uh, you're going to have to make a payment uh, either September 15th or uh, January 16th. And I think that's part of the reason why Sam and Paul uh, scheduled this early enough so you get time to make sure you get this. Uh, there are sometimes we have it in March for the year end and we talk about it and people realize they hadn't done the quarterly estimated tax payments the year earlier and that's not very helpful so part of the reason we're out here now is to make sure you're aware of this um and the way you do it is you pay it on a form 1040 because that's the form es for estimated taxes and you have to put your social security number on it now you can do this electronically now so it's not even like a form anymore it's very easy very straightforward um, what's interesting, again, uh, we've talked about the Fed government and the state, they both tax you on the same dollar. So you may have to do quarterly uh, taxes at the state level. I've never heard of Michigan being particularly difficult about that. I will tell you the federal government's very good about sending out notices. Uh, and many times, in, in certain cases anyway, they can be incorrect. So you want to make sure if you get something from the federal government, not only that, they really charge extremely high interest rates. So if they feel you should have paid it and you didn't, you can really get hit with a large penalty. Um, and what scares me is, of course, if ever you have noncompliance with the IRS, there's buckets. There's the in bucket and then there's the audit bucket. And you want to avoid the audit bucket. So they, they, could, they could very well decide that um, the fact that you can't do your taxes correctly is a good reason to come audit you. And uh, uh, 
Uh, so you, you do run that risk. So you want to make sure you pay attention to this um, as you go. And I don't know if anybody's made the payments yet. If you haven't yet made a payment, you might want to start a little earlier just before the date required. Just make sure you can get it done appropriately. Ed, um, how do payments work if folks are beginning in September? And so they don't get their first stipend, stipend payment until then. Someone asks, do they not need to pay until January 16th? Yeah, I think that's correct. Now, again, we come down to cash because cash basis determines when you received it. Um, and if you said, I couldn't get it till September 1st, well, then you fall into that bucket. If you get paid August 31st, you fall into the third quarter, um, uh, which has to be paid by September 15th. So um, it would be nice. Now, you can't go tell somebody, they go, here's the check. You go, I, I don't want it to September 1st because theoretically it's yours. Um, but if the payment date is that date, or they say we'll issue these on the 31st and they don't get to you to the first, then it falls into that latter quarter. Um, and it gives you that much more time. But all, all it does is what quarter does it go into? And again, it's the first three months. So March 31st is it. Then it's, uh, and then June 15th means it's April and May. So it's May 31st. And again, that's where the two months come in. Um, and then they go back to three months. Um, um, June, July, and August, and that's what brings you up to September. And then it's from September on, the five, four months there, that uh, gets you through. So that's how it is. So that's a good question. I think a lot of it comes down to facts and circumstances, but basically it's time value of money. So if you should have done it in the third quarter and did it in the fourth, and the IRS comes out and audits you and figures out it's been earlier, they'll hit you with penalties for the difference between what they could have earned in interest, which they seem to think is a lot higher than it ever was, and uh, um, from the day you, you you didn't pay it when you should. That's the idea. If someone hasn't paid the past two quarters, um, could they pay for them uh, for the September deadline? Oh yeah. In fact, if you miss it, if you miss it by a day, pay it the next day because the penalties run by how many days you're outstanding. So you don't want to wait any time. If somebody comes in and goes, you haven't made your payment yet? No, no. Well, should have done that April 15th. Oh my goodness. What's well, April 18th? I guess it's too late. It's never too late. Do it. And you're only three days late. And the penalty may not even, depending upon what your tax liability, the penalty may be a dollar. Send it in. Get it done. Uh, if you hold on to it, the penalties will be higher. They accrue daily. Great. Thank you. Then one, okay. So in this way, just to recap yeah. for NRAs. Only yearly as possible, not quarterly, with a due date of April 15th. 14% tax will be automatically withheld by the university when the stipend is paid, regardless of being a GSI. And the forms that they would need to fill out are forms 1042S and 1040NR. A W-2 will be provided by the university close to April 15th. Well, that's close. So we'll review this again. So it's a good recap. So if you're non-resident alien, that scenario is where you have both uh, a stipend for a period of time, and then you work at the University of Michigan. You're going to get a 1040 us from the University of Michigan. You don't complete it. They do. They'll withhold for you. When you've worked as a GSI for the rest, remainder of the year, you'll get a W-2 from the University of Michigan. You don't fill that out. In both scenarios, they do everything for you. They identify the tax liability, they compute it, and they withhold for you. And then all you have to worry about is making that payment the following April 15th. It's always good when you have different things coming up like this to make sure you're covered, but you should be covered from that scenario. Uh, so, and it depends. But, uh, Sam, so sometimes, though, you know, you have the W-2 and you say, I want uh, you know, the, you know, you have to fill out the withholding statement and how many you want, you know, how many withhold. And the higher number you put in on the W, uh, on the W-4, so they're, they're called exemptions. The higher you do, the less they withhold. So if you have a lot of deductions, a lot of things going on in your world, you have a lot of different businesses, you're going to say, this scholarship, uh, I'm really not going to be taxed on this at all. Or you're married and your spouse is very active and has a lot of things are over withheld. You don't have to withhold here. I don't want anything withheld. So you can put down like a 10, in which case you put a 10, they're not going to withhold on your scholarship or fellowship. But if you put a zero, they're going to withhold the highest. Well, so Sam, even though we're saying they're going to withhold for you, you still determine how much payroll is going to withhold. So if you tell them, give me everything now in taxes, don't withhold anything. And then you go to file the tax return next April 15th. You may find out that 
you owe a penalty because you didn't pay it in as you go. So you have to make sure that you, and you, you determine that, you're making sure that they're withholding enough as they go. That's the idea. Um, I keep mine to zero and I get a refund every year, um, which is, they call uh, you know, taxification, right? I mean, I get all excited about something for a moment till I realize it's really my money I'm getting back. But the idea is um, you do have to make sure you're managing uh, your own withholdings. But yeah, the, 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 the summary is not bad. I don't think you necessarily have to worry about estimated tax payments because any and all monies you're getting has been gone through where someone's giving you a form for it and done a withhold. So you should feel pretty comfortable. You may want to check it just to make sure, but that shouldn't be a problem. And with estimated taxes, we'll talk about this in a minute, but you only have to pay in 90% of the amount. That means April 15th of next year, you get to pay 10% of the total liability and you still won't have a penalty. So you still have some wiggle room, so to speak. So that's that's a good recap. Um, what, thank you. Um, there are forms that we that students need to seek out themselves versus the forms that the university provides. Can you um, remind us which ones we need to seek out ourselves? Well, I think you got to do a 1040 ES, um, um, both Fed and state, I suppose, um, and then multi-state. Again, your your subject to have to figure out how to do that. Um, but I think that the, see, the interesting thing about forms, um, and again, if you any kind of form you need, if they give you a 1098T and you have to do an 8863, it's going to be in the instructions and, and so forth. So you're going to find a lot of this. So it's very intuitive. And they tell you, but they want you to be able to fill out your taxes correctly. They want your money. They're very good about telling you what you need to do. So I think you can find that. Um, and I think it's just a matter of where to start and what do I need to do to get there, which is more or less uh, some, of, some of the other stuff that we're going to talk about. But do look at publications because even just glance at them, they're very helpful. And the 970 is about students and student benefits. And it's going to talk about the 1098T. It's going to talk about scholarships and taxation of scholarships uh, and so forth. So do feel free to go through that. And I think a lot of what we're talking about will, will uh, come back to you. Uh, something about tax too, by the way. You don't, you never get it the first time. It's called a ripple effect. You get a little bit the first time, then you hear it again, you get a little bit more. And over time, you, you're like, yeah, I think I got it now. Uh, also, as a resource, if you can, talk to each other. I mean, you're both on the same boat. And someone's going to say, I thought you could do this. Then I thought it was this way. And you find out it's, it could be both or neither. But the bottom line is, is you're going to work with each other. You're, you're, you're your own best resource. So feel free to share. Thank you, Ed. Um, so how do I, how do I even do correlates my taxes? And that's why that, the question that came back on, uh, the, 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 do you get the standard deduction quarterly or annually? Here, are you, what's going to be your annual income? How much do you think you're going to get in stipends? You pretty much know what you're going to get. Uh, so that's the nice thing. Then you apply the, sti the, the uh, standard deduction 13. And in this case, it's the, um, we're down with, uh, after you subtract out the 13, we are at 14,750. You do the tax on that, that tax, 1550 is over $1,000. So you do have a quarterly estimated tax obligation. So then you say, okay, well, then that's where the 90% comes in. I really only need to pay in $1,395 throughout the year. And that extra difference, I can just pay in April 15th of the following year. And you can claim that way. And then I can only pay in, I'm only going to pay in what I need to pay in. And in this case, they have a, we have a quarterly amount. So you come up with $350, $349. But the idea is, um, you can manage this any way you want. You can pay it. You can pay the fifteen fifty right in April of twenty three, so that you don't have to worry about the rest of twenty three, and you're comfortable, um, and so forth. So you can manage it any way you want. But this will give you an idea of what you owe. What's interesting, not only do you have to pay this in, and when do you want to pay it? There's a budget issue. You thought this whole thing was tax free when they gave you this amount of money. You thought it was all yours. It's not. One thousand five hundred fifty dollars can't be spent at the bar or paying rent or whatever you wanna do, it's gotta to go to the IRS. And there's also something that possibly may have to go to the state as well. So something to keep in mind, it's a budget perspective as well. All righty, I'm gonna move on, Sam, if I can. Got any questions? Yeah, if someone has two different scholarships for the year, do they put the total amount on one form? Do they need to fill out two separate forms? Or That's an really excellent question. Yeah, you uh, what you uh, scholarships? It depends what you know. If you're a non-resident alien, you get 1042 S's, and if you're a U.S. citizen or resident alien, you get nothing. But the tax return, there's one tax return for 12 months. Those 12 months, pretty much calendar year, January to December. So all the money you make 
in that time period falls into that tax return. So it's all one big bucket as far as the IRS is concerned. And then from there, and that also includes spouses. So to the extent your spouse is making money, they're also being withheld. And they can just go to work and say, hey, payroll, can you withhold a little bit more for me? Um, that way I, you can cover my spouse's taxation on scholarships and fellowships. So that's another way to shift the burden. But the bottom line is it all goes on one return. And whoever you allow on your tax return, well, you know, uh, you, that's where you're married filing jointly. And you can do that if you like. So there's a lot of different ways to look at the return and to manage it. But all your income for that tax period goes into one bucket. So it's a very good question. Um, do know the IRS is having enough trouble with the tax returns as they are. They don't need two for one person, <laughs> uh, seeing how they're they're shredding what they have. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, here's what a 1042S looks like. And again, it's not a whole form. It's just enough information to tell the IRS who you are and how much you paid in. Uh, by the way, uh, again, this was in the old days, you had to mail this in. Today, it's much simpler with the uh, uh, electronic filing. And uh, all I ask you to do is keep receipts. I think you're going to find that the IRS will many times take your money but forget you've paid. So they come back and go, we don't have any record of it. So you need to keep records because they don't. And you'll get to respond to them and say, oh, yeah, you took it from me. And uh, they're OK about that once you explain it to them. But we do see a lot of times they I've never seen them come back and say you overpaid. We don't have any evidence of this, but they do usually say you're underpaid. So something to keep in mind. And this, again, this comes out of an IRS publication. This is to help you organize when you have to pay it, what the amount, and this is all to help you uh, be organized and uh, orderly. And the IRS wants that because the more organized you are, the more time you're going to pay, and they want the money as soon as possible. Um, so um, that'll help pay the interest we have on our trillion dollar debt problem. Um, so then you say, okay, fine, but I forgot. What are the penalties? Oh, all right, there are penalties. Um, and it's interesting, if you paid in 100% of last year's tax, you're not going to have a problem. Now, that tends to happen when you got a raise this year, $20,000 raise. You can pay in last year's amount and keep the tax difference until April 15th of the next year. It's time value of money. Uh, it doesn't really impact me uh, and people at my, at my level. But if you're very wealthy, it can be something. That's a lot of money you can earn interest on in the meantime, rather than have the IRS earn it. So that's the idea. But what applies more for us is the 90%. That's for everybody. And as you go along, you find out that you did your taxes wrong. You thought you paid it all in. You didn't. And you owe a small amount. But if it's less than 10% of the total liability, you're still not going to be subject to penalties. That's the wiggle room. And again, there's the exception we mentioned. If the entire amount that you owe is less than $1,000, they're not going to hit you for anything anyway. So, um, and don't be offended, but the rationale is, is that thousand dollars doesn't do anything for the debt we have to deal with. So you might as well hold on to your money because you're just making more paperwork for us. And, uh, that's more administrative time. And, uh, by the time we get your thousand, we spent 3000 to get your thousand. No, thanks. Keep it and give it to us the following April. Uh, but that said, they do want it the following April. Now, I'm going to get up to uh, multi-state issues, but before I leave that, um, uh, Sam, any questions on quarterly? Specifically quarterly, no. You've been very thorough. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I want you to know, you know, it's, it's a thing of confidence because you haven't done it before. Um, it, it is just basic math. Um, and a lot of times it's always going to be something you forgot or whatever. And again, that's where you check each other's math. Uh, it's like anything else. And uh, it's really, uh, I found it to be extremely helpful. I found students to be, uh, to really manage this burden. I've been very impressed over the years, done this for about 26 years, I know. And I've been very impressed with how students have been able to manage this. This could be a high anxiety at the beginning of the session. Uh, and by the end, they feel better. And by next time we give it, which usually back in March, and you know, all the same folks show up, everybody feels pretty comfortable about where their situation is. So kudos to students. I think you are as bright as people say you are. Uh, and, and the test of that is handling taxes, and you do that well. Um, and Dave Barry, uh, I've always found this extremely funny, because when you read through the stuff, you will find it. It's not it's not simple. It's not meant to be, um, but it's not simple. And uh um, you know, the worst is I, I've been doing this for so long, I start talking like what I'm reading, and, and that's a problem too. So, um, uh, but just the same. So, states, 
What do we have with states? Well, uh, pretty much if you got a filing requirement for the Fed, you may for the state if it has an income tax regime. And as I mentioned, most states do. So you got to file a state return. And again, you'll be paying tax on the same uh, money that you paid to the Fed government. It's not, it's not as if you, you get an exception for that. Um, then you may have a situation where if you've been in two states at the same time during the year and made money, you, you may have to file two returns, one to each state, uh, in addition to the Fed return. Um, and again, that comes down to, and this is always a very interesting topic. Well, well how does this work? Um, uh, what, what does it mean? I was in another state. Well, and we'll get into this, but domicile is very important. Uh, where do you really believe your home state is? Just like when we talked about home country on worldwide income. And it basically turns on intent. So that's very important to keep in mind because that's up to you folks to be able to define that. And, and so what we're going to get into now is when you start doing your taxes, and we saw some of this with cool estimated taxes, you start walking out on a plank. You're responsible for your own tax situation. And you're in a position to be able to make the decisions you need to make that really determine what it is. And if you make the wrong decision, you'll get hammered with penalties and so forth. And they won't take any sympathy to you because you had the power, so to speak, to make that call early on. They believe if you're responsible, you need to manage it right. Um, so, but at the same time, it's also planning. If you do it appropriately, yeah, you, you dotted the I's and crossed the T's, you're good. But it is a it is a, an issue that when I say it's an additional tax burden, it's truly your burden. Um, so if you're in multi-states, how does that work, right? I mean, I get iota the Fed and I owe the state of Michigan on the same dollar. That upsets me enough. But is that I got two states? Are they both going to tax me? And we'll get into how uh, your home state taxes you on your worldwide income, just like the Fed. And if they're going to tax you on a worldwide income, what about Michigan? I mean, they're taxing me too just like the Ireland situation. Am I getting taxed twice? And then how does that work? And as we mentioned, it's pretty much the same. If the state that's actually your home state is actually going to tax you, uh, in many cases, depending upon what situation you want to do, if you want to continue to be a resident of that state, yeah, you may have to pay in the difference. And we have an example to, that shows that. So anyway, there's a lot here, but do take, take comfort in the fact that we do try to avoid double taxation between the states on the same amount of money. And uh, uh, either you leave from one state and go to another and we, we cut it there. It just doesn't happen to be during the calendar year end. Or we have a, where you stay as a resident of your home state. And then we have to make sure that if you're paying to both states, there's no double tax. So that's the idea. You'll feel comfortable with that. Now, one of the good news about uh, filing in Michigan, and I think you will all have to file in Michigan if you've got a scholarship or uh, fellowship payment, um, because it's, it's Michigan sourced income. It doesn't matter if you're a non-resident alien. It doesn't matter if you're a citizen of California. You got money in Michigan. So you owe tax to Michigan on the extent of that money. Now, if you're a Michigan resident, you're taxed on your worldwide income. But if you're not, you still will have to pay to Michigan as a non-resident on the Michigan source revenue. Um, good news is there's a credit. We call it the Michigan Homestead Exemption. Um, and it is a refundable credit. So you should be very excited about this. Um, and it applies to students. You don't have to necessarily own property, just rent property. And I think you'll see as you go through, uh, there are certain advantages to that. The issue is you have to be a Michigan resident for at least six months. That comes back to, well, I've been in the state for seven months, but I really want to be California. Okay, that's fine. Then you're not entitled to it. But I want to be, I want the credit. Well, do you want to be a Michigan resident? And you say yes. And we say, well, what's your, what's your domicile? What's your intent? And you just have to back it up. So did you, if you're in Michigan, did you change your driver's license? And that comes back to that address question. Um, did you, do you vote? Do you vote in Michigan or do you vote in California? Uh, I keep picking on California because they have a higher tax bracket than Michigan. So you, whatever you're paying tax on to Michigan on that income, the stipend, you will pay additional tax to California on that same stipend. And that is double tax. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's a higher tax bracket. So bottom line is, uh, you want to identify the states that you're in, and to the extent your home state has a tax regime and it's greater than Michigan's, you want to change your residency. And changing your residency means your lease, your bank accounts, but more importantly, your driver's license and voting. Uh, these are these are pretty hardcore documents that prove that you may, you moved and you changed your residency. Um, the fact that you change your residency is independent of any other independent or, or dependent type of uh, 
uh, determination that we make here at the University of Michigan. So your FAFSA for financial aid, you can still be a non-resident for FAFSA and a resident for tax. It's not connected. It's not related. Um, that said, if you walk around wearing a Michigan jersey, thinking that means, means you've changed your residence, that won't be enough. I just want you to know. It has to be a little bit stronger. Um, but if you are a Michigan resident, you could be entitled to the exemption. So your case study, eight thousand uh, dollars. Now, for Fed, that means no tax, right? Thirteen thousand uh, dollars of, of a deduction. But here, that's not how it's going to work at Michigan. Uh, no other income was earned. Uh, the student's not claimed as a dependent by anyone else, and as a Michigan resident, qualifies for the homestead. This is great. And this is what the Michigan return looks like. And you see the box there on line eight, uh, resident, and you see on line nine a. One exemption, so you get five thousand dollars of a deduction. Not not thirteen eight fifty five, but against the eight thousand twenty five, you owe three thousand twenty five, and the tax on that is one hundred twenty three dollars. And what we have over here in red is the fact that again, this is the twenty two form. It was at four point two five percent, and this year for twenty three, they dropped it to four point oh five, and that's what we're that's what we're trying to show you. So this is a twenty three calculation on a twenty two form. They have yet to come out with the twenty two form. Um, so over here, the second page, you got 123. That's what you owe. And then they say, do you have any credits? And you go, well, yeah, I did do, I have a property tax credit for 425. And that means you get $302 back. That's the refundable credit. So good news is you thought you were going to owe. And in fact, the state of Michigan is giving you money. You know, Michigan doesn't like giving money to people. So they have a website that talks about this and it's not very generous uh, uh, toward the, uh, as far as interpretations toward the students, but you may want to read it just the same. So you feel comfortable about it and you get to be able to make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's. And this, this is the cups within cups that I was talking about. If you deduct that number 425, where to come from? Well, there's a homestead form that you got to fill out and this can be convoluted, convoluted, but it basically, how much are you paying in rent? How much did you earn? Certain percentages taken to both. It turns out that Based on this calculation, uh, you're going to take $425 as a credit, which ties back to what's there on line 25. So they need to have that attachment. They're also going to ask you other questions as well, but just the same, you might have other forms. So if the question was, what kind of forms do you need? Those forms will come through to you on the instructions. They'll tell you exactly what you need so you can complete the form. Uh, so that's if you're a Mich Michigan resident. Now we're at the non-resident piece, and there's one of two things. Either you've you were in another state at the beginning of the year and left it and are now a Michigan resident, or you have stayed, you keep your residency in that state, you live in Michigan, but you still consider yourself a, um, a resident of your, uh, of your home state. Now, um, uh, if you, in the first year you have that, either scenario, you're filing to both states. You're filing a return to the state you were in and you're filing to a state you moved to or you're gonna to file to a state you continue to keep your home uh, state and you're gonna to have to file Michigan. You're always gonna to have to file Michigan because you have Michigan sourced income. Um, but in the latter scenario where you're part year resident and you, you move from one state to another, you just calculate that first year's return based on the months that you were in or the stay that you were in the other state. And then, then when you move to Michigan, uh, what goes to Michigan? So it's gonna be a, a year's worth of time, but split between the two. And the second year, if you continue to be a Michigan resident, you only have to file the one return, Michigan. If you choose the, the non-resident scenario, that's where you're always going to be uh, a resident of your home state. And you're only going to pay, and then, you, then, you, then you're going to be a Michigan, a non-resident for Michigan forevermore. Now, that's not desirable, unless maybe you're in a state that has no income tax regime like Florida. I would continue to be, I continue to keep Florida as my home state. I'm not paying anything in Florida. That way with Michigan, I'm only going to pay tax on my non or my Michigan sourced income, not the full amount. Now, do students have a lot of other monies? I suppose, I suppose you may. We've had some scenarios with some uh, students have come up with questions about their schedule K's and their uh, cap gains from big investments and their re rental properties and others, not so much. So the idea is uh, uh, it's something to keep in mind, but it's more personal to you. Again, when you go to change residency, uh, it's based on your intent. So if you said, I changed, fine. The more evidence you have to back that up, the stronger your position will be. And if you want to be a Michigan resident and take that real property or the property tax credit, the homestead exemption, um, 
you're going to have to prove you've been here six months and you're going to have to prove your domicile. That was your intent to domicile, be here in Michigan. And that's, again, driver's license, voting registration, um, bank accounts, um, lease arrangements and so on. So that's the idea. That's the hub of it. So as we get into this return, we have a case study that shows this well. You get a $30,000 grant from NIH and $70 of interest income. We haven't really dealt with this before, but this is that additional income. This is very important because um, if, you, if you take one scenario in Michigan, the, US store, the Michigan sourced income is only the $30,000. Um, you're a resident of Massachusetts and you're not claimed as a dependent. And that's important because dependent does apply at the state level. And you can see if you're dependent, Somebody else, you, you they, they may claim your exemption, you don't. So it all depends what the state law says. Do know the tax rates differ by just under 1%. This doesn't sound like much. Okay. So here's the Michigan return. Um, and um, it should say non-resident. Sorry, I think that's a, a, a misprint. We've got 30,000. We take out the 70 because that's not in Michigan. We're only doing Michigan sourced revenue. Then we do the 5,000 deduction. We get the full 5,000 because most of the income is in Michigan. So we get most of the exemption, which leaves us with 25. And when you do the tax on that at the, just the 4.05%, you get 1,013. So just over $1,000 worth of taxes is owed to Michigan. Now, again, you break it out and you show where total income, it's 30, 70, only 30 in Michigan, and then 70 to the other state. And that's really determine how much of the exemption you get. Then this is to show exactly why you're pulling out. What are you pulling out? What kind of income is it that would be uh, to that other state? It's If it's more of the scholarship, it belongs in Michigan. And that's what they want to know. And in this case, it's interest income. If you have a home state in Massachusetts, that's where you earned it. So basically, that's your $70. And you get to deduct that off the Michigan return because Michigan only gets to tax Michigan source revenue. Um, now, this comes through in another another piece of it to just basically confirm what you're doing. Everything's good. So now we get to Massachusetts. You're filing two returns now. Massachusetts says, well, let's start with the Fed number, 30,070, because you always start with the Fed number. In this case, your exemption is 4,400. More generous, may I say, than Michigan. Well, I guess Michigan's up to 5,000. So we have we just changed that. Um, so now you got $30,070. You see how it breaks out. And the tax on that at 5%, and that's line 21 at the very bottom, is 1,504. So you owe to Massachusetts 1,504. You just paid 1,013 to Michigan. And now I got to pay 1,504 to Massachusetts. That's double tax. And Massachusetts says, yes, but what we'll do is give you a credit for what you paid. So we won't, you know, basically, you don't have to pay us the full 1,504, just less whatever we, the difference of what you paid to Michigan. So you go, all right, well, I paid 1,013 to Michigan. And they go, okay, so you owe us $491. You go, know, wow, but I paid Michigan a tax on $30,000. It was only the 70 that I didn't pay tax on. And you go, yes, yes, it is. But I'm paying $491 on $70? And you go, yes, that sounds like, that's terrible. Yes, it is. You should have changed your dumps. So that's the way this works. And I think that is unfortunate, but you have to know your what your intent is, your domicile. You have to know what home state you want to have and whether it's worth keeping from a tax perspective. Again, if you change it, you change your residency, it's independent to any other type of uh, legal issue that you have with respect to your residency. So it's just for tax purposes and tax purposes only. So, but in this case, you can see you paid 491, whereas you would only have paid um, uh, probably, uh, let's see, 4% on $70. So you're talking under five dollars uh, so you know clearly you want to look into this and it was only a percent difference california is ridiculous it's much higher so you want to look into this but again if you come from a home state that has no tax regime you don't want to change because michigan won't ever tax that 70 dollars. they'll only get the tax to 30. now that doesn't sound like a lot but next year it could be a lot you, know, you could get a huge distribution and a cap gain or something like that and michigan won't be able to tax it whereas Florida won't because they don't have a tax regime. So that's the idea. So something to keep in mind, you got to know your own finances and how to work it. And you need to know you need you are responsible for building your own case to be able to defend your position should you get uh, asked about it. That's the idea. And we have a few right. questions. Um, 
Does someone qualify for the homestead if they've been a resident in Michigan for six months by the tax day, or does it have to be six months by December 31st? Oh, tax day meaning April 15th, the following mm -hmm. year. Yeah, no, you, it's a calendar year thing. So for the six months in this calendar year that you're actually completing your taxes. So if you got here in September, you won't qualify. Okay. You're, you're only be four months in September. Yeah. And some someone works for a company, thank you, by the way, who's helping provide tuition assistance. And under section 127, they know that, mm -hmm. that they're able to provide 5250 in tax. That's tax free. Do they include that on their W-2 or will the company handle it on their end? Well, that's a great question. What the, what will happen is it won't go in box one on your W-2 for taxable income. There'll be a note, though, in one of the boxes that says, here's why. We did make a payment. You just, it's not subject to tax. So it'll be identified, but it won't be taxable income. And importantly, the state itself should follow that as well. So um, code section 127. So you should be good. Okay, thank you. Someone believes that the state of Michigan and the state of Illinois have a, a tax agreement that allows them to um, file only one, taxes for one of them. If they intend on filing their taxes as a resident of Illinois, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, that's called the reciprocal tax. And we have it with all the border states, including Minnesota, which isn't much of a border. Um, but um, you, it's hard you typically see the employer do it because the employer has to do the withholding. It's much more difficult for individuals to qualify for it, but they could. It's just a lot of paperwork. Um, some people feel it's easier just to, particularly if you're part of your resident, you're only going to file it to one state, you file it and you're done. Um, you're going to need to do that to some extent because uh, um, trying to explain your scenario is because you know, Illinois tax rate is, I think, very similar to the tax rates are very similar. So it's not like it, it's a huge um, benefit to get one over the other. But um, my sense is we have done it. Uh, you can do it. You're entitled to do it. Um, but if you're doing it as an, independent, as an ind independent individual rather than your employer doing it on your behalf, it can get to be very complicated because you have to make payments to your state agency. And, um, and, that's, and that's what they're, they're just going to pretend as if uh, the person stayed home and they didn't go anywhere. So it can be, it can be rather challenging. But uh, I'll leave it up to them. But reciprocal is what it's called, reciprocal states. And there's usually a phone call will probably get to most of what you need uh, rather than any, you'll know, do some research, but my phone call will get you where you need to be, I think. Thanks, Ed. We have a few questions about quarterly. Someone and their spouse have been filing jointly and they square up um, in April. But now that this person has to file quarterly and their spouse is still earning only a W-2, do they as um, a couple file quarterly or does just the student file quarterly and then they square up at the at, in April once a year still? Yeah, so um, um, my sense is uh, when you have, uh, if they're filing jointly, then it's their return. And you could have a situation where the one spouse who has a withholding withholds not just for their income, but for their spouse's income as well. They just ask payroll to increase it. Um, instead of withholding it 10%, make it 12%, not 2% covers my spouse's tax on scholarships. So the idea is you can shift it that way back and forth. Then if reconciliation on the, uh, the, the, the catch up, if you will, come next April 15th, I don't know if it's a situation where you, you, you know, how that works. I don't know what they mean, whether they mean catch up between each other. So I paid for some, you know, I had more withheld from me and that was your taxes. You owe me the difference. Or if that's just, what do we owe the IRS now uh, with what we've done? Uh, usually it's the latter. But my sense is if that's the case, then, you know, you know, I, I, I would try to get out of paying quarterly estimated tax payments. So if uh, my, uh, um, um, I've been married for 30 years. So if my wife was working and independently, she does some arts and crafts. And uh, if she made money, she doesn't make any money. So let's just say she makes money. Um, then she'd say, I have quarterly estimated taxes to pay. I'd say, hey, I'm just going to go to payroll and ask them to increase the withholding on my salary. That way, um, you don't have to do anything because it's all one bucket. And all the IRS cares is that you paid in so much. They don't care who pays it. And they don't care uh, necessarily which, which of the two. Just pay it in and we're good enough. 
If you two want to work that out between you, fine, but I just care that enough money came across. So you can always shift it back and forth saying. Okay, great. Thanks. And does the information discussed today apply to postdocs? How much of it does? Yeah, I, it, well, actually broadly defined taxpayer, it's everybody. Okay. And you're a postdoc, you're either one, you're either an NRA or you're going to be an uh, RA or a U.S. citizen. Either way, you're subject to this these tax rules. Okay. And if someone received a moving stipend in mid-July, um, they will have to pay tax on this by September 15th, yes? Um, well, uh, it, 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 that's a, first, it is taxable, two concepts here, because uh, there's no exception for moving. So you got stipend. And, and you paid and you used it to pay to move to, to get yourself here. Um, you could have done a lot of things with that. That's what you chose to spend it on. It doesn't matter. It's still taxable income. Now, whether you have to pay tax on it or not, because it comes into your taxable situation, uh, really comes down to what your tax situation looks like. Um, but if you if that's all you've got as far as money and that's what you earn, then, you know, bottom line is when you add up your annual amount, do you think it'll be a thousand or more? If it's more than a thousand, yeah, you may have to do a quarterly estimated tax payment to both the Fed and the state, uh, depending upon which, uh, the, the amount of money. You should think about it. Let's put it that way. I, okay. I say it because it comes down to your individual tax situation. You know, everybody has something different, right? So they're like, oh, I thought it'd be taxable. It's taxable. Whether you have to pay tax or not comes down to your tax situation. So some people may have worked before that before they moved at a company that was withholding. In fact, it was over withholding on their income. They were going to get back a huge refund. Then whatever tax you pay on the moving expense is basically going to be offset by that amount that they over withheld. So you can see how that works. So that's the scenario. Okay, thanks, Ed. And someone expects to get a child credit for having a dependent when they file on April 15th. How would this impact their quarterly taxes? Would they pay quarterly and then possibly get a refund when they file in April? Um, yeah, well, that's one way to do it. You can overpay. You can also, when you go back to that uh, slide on how to compute your taxes, you do it annually and you bring in the child care credit and uh, that helps reduce the tax. So now you know how much you have, uh, how much you have, which has been reduced by the credit to pay throughout the year. That's all. But, and you can always work it, uh, Sam, where you pay more in the quarters, knowing you're going to get a huge amount back next April. Uh, a lot of people do that. Again, in taxification, because it's your money you're getting back. No reason to get overly excited. But um, it is, that's one way to do it. We, uh, my wife and I, we tend to over withhold uh, because, you know, we always get a nice bill at the end and it always comes in handy. So, um, and I'm, I'm a, and I'm, we're both accountants and you'd think we'd be much more savvy about our money, but not a lot of money. Um, but the idea is uh, we prefer that. That's that's we, we look for, you know, I'm more worried about making sure we enjoy our lives than uh, than making sure I, I do everything right by uh, financially for, for my tax plan. So this is the idea. OK, thank you, Ed. And so when you say your tax situation, um, someone made income from a job but worked in Florida and only received this moving stipend from Michigan, and it would be less than $1,000, which means they don't need to file quarterly, correct? So, um, oh, yeah, so that was, uh, now you're getting into a lot of good stuff. So um, you worked at a company in Florida because you got fed and state taxes. And then in addition to your taxes, they gave you $1,000, which they probably didn't withhold on. So um, from a fed perspective, you got to figure out how much they withheld and whether that thousand dollars, it has taxes, but it may be covered because whatever taxes you have, they over withheld on the general uh, wages, which they may have done. You'd have to know you you did the W-4 that talked about how much withholding they should have. You meaning the employee or this individual. Um, from a state perspective, the question is, does a thousand dollars fall into Florida or does it fall into Michigan? And uh, for that, you'd have to read the instructions on Michigan, because a lot of times states say if you move from, you don't get to count it. But if you move to, you do. So Michigan's thinking they're going to get that thousand um, dollars. Florida doesn't have a regime, so they're not going to give you any help because um, not, there's not going to be any instructions or any rules because they, they don't have the reason for. It. Um, but there is a question. And I'd like to take the argument that that thousand um, dollars was not meant to be. Uh, spent in Michigan, it was spent every state getting to Michigan. Um, so I'd like to think it's not all taxable, and I would I would look into that. But 
Um, that's just me. Thanks, Ed. Okay, well, I'm checking time. So we've got three minutes. So uh, if I can, I think I made my point. I just want to finish with this last slide. These are the publications, somewhat helpful, but again, written, biased by the IRS for the IRS. Um, that said, they are very helpful for this ripple effect, pulling up a lot of concepts that we talked about and getting to understand them and feel better about them. Um, do know a lot of positions the IRS takes can be challenged and you're free to do that. So um, if you do, you want to make sure you document it and you want to keep your 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 receipts or whatever the situation is um, so you can defend it. The problem is when you're audited, you're not audited within three months or four months of filing the return. You'll be audited about two years afterwards. Um, typically, you may not even be at the University of Michigan. You may not even be in Michigan anymore. Um, so do keep in mind that, uh, and what happened is many times you've, you've moved multiple places since then. And many times you've moved and you didn't bring that box, that box you kept with all the receipts. Um, or you're, uh, I think that way, I think, uh, you know, I don't think digitally, but even digitally, you, you delete your file. Whatever happens, you want to make sure that you are always thinking about taxes each year and that you tie it together for previous years as well, at least until the audit period passes. Thank you, Ed. Um, I have two more questions. Is there any yeah. place on campus that can help students fill out their tax forms for their stipends? They have a VITA program, a volunteer a tax a, a, a program. A bunch of accountants and tax preparers get together and offer this service pretty much in the month of March and the first two weeks of April. Um, other than that, there's the the International Center we talked about, which is extremely helpful for non-resident aliens. I mean, extremely helpful. Um, but I think that's about it. Okay, thanks. And is the stipend that folks receive from the university considered to be eligible for an IRA, specifically a Roth IRA? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So IRAs, they come in uh, individual retirement accounts. Um, and that's like any kind of the KEO or any other kind of arrangement you want to come up with. That's always based on earned income. Uh, this wouldn't be earned income, so it wouldn't qualify. And okay. you'll know it's earned income because you're paying FICA or self-employment tax on it. So again, you're paying 15.3% additional tax or at least half of that with FICA. Uh, so it's not always it's not always a benefit. Okay, thank you, Ed. Thank right. you very much. Thanks, folks, and uh, have a good day. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We will have the slides available uh, for those, correct, Ed? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I've already sent off uh, the slides to Paul, uh, okay. and I think it's been copied. So I think what I just showed you here, I think you've got a copy of. Okay. We will make sure that the slides are available to you. Um, in the coming days. And thank you for attending and thank you for your questions and for participating. And um, we hope you have a great day.